Okay, here we are. Understanding your religion, seven major doctrines that define the Christian faith. Lesson number 23, Lord willing. Next week will be our last in the, in, the, in the series. But this lesson, we're going to be talking about the doctrine of the second coming, and this will be part one of that. And this is, Jesus describes the end. So let's back up as we do for the first minute or so, get a big, uh, you know, big view picture. We have been studying the major doctrines that explain the Christian faith. That's what this class has been about. Uh, teachings that in a very organized way answer the question, what is Christianity all about and what are its most basic teachings? That's why we say you know, uh, the seven major doctrines that define the Christian faith. Uh, we've chosen seven of the most important teachings to examine in this course. Certainly there are more than just seven you know, doctrines in the, in the Bible, but we've selected the seven most basic ones that you know, once, if you know these seven, you have a pretty good idea of the Christian faith. And very quickly we said, here's the whole picture right here. This is the whole course. So we said the seven major doctrines over on the, well be your, uh, yeah, on the left there. Uh, the inspiration of the Bible, the deity of Christ, the doctrine of the original goodness of man, the doctrine of the fall of man, the doctrine of the reconciliation of man with God. How God reconciles man back to himself. And then I said, or we in this class, we examine the 10 sub-doctrines that explain the, major, the fifth major doctrine. Reconciliation has under, underneath its heading, if you wish, 10 sub-doctrines that explain how and who and so on and so forth, how God, uh, uh, succeeded in reconciling man back to himself. Then the, um, and I said that uh, the first five sub-doctrines actually explain God's plan of salvation and the other five sub-doctrines explain the plan of salvation from five different perspectives. From the human perspective, the legal perspective, heavenly perspective, inward perspective, and the eschatological meaning from the end, the end result perspective. And then the sixth, sixth doctrine, the kingdom of God, talked about that last time, and then the seventh major doctrine, uh, the second coming of Jesus. Now in our last lesson about the nature of the kingdom of God, I said to you that Jesus in His parables and in His Sermon on the Mount, uh, He describes the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and how it operates here on earth. So we said that the kingdom of heaven is a spiritual entity with Jesus at the center and those who believe in Him tied to Him and tied to one another by faith. That's the kingdom of God here on earth. We call it the church, right? So the kingdom or church, we said last week, functions according to God's will and purpose as it awaits its fulfillment when Jesus returns. So this fulfillment of the kingdom, okay, involves several things. It involves, first of all, the resurrection and glorification of all the saints, meaning all Christians will be raised up glorified, meaning equipped with spiritual bodies that will enable them, enable us, to exist in the spiritual dimension. Remember I told you we have a physical body that enables us to live here in the physical dimension, because you know, we, we can drink the water and eat the food and breathe the air. You know, we have a body that enables us to live in this dimension. Well, when we are glorified, we will have a body that will enable us to exist in the spiritual dimension. Then uh, at the fulfillment of the kingdom, the punishment of the wicked from Satan on down. The passing away of the present heaven and earth to be replaced with the new heaven and earth. That also will happen. And the unification of the church and the Godhead into eternity. Meaning that the saints, the church, will be unified with the Godhead. You know, uh, where Paul says that we will reign with Him at the right hand of God. 
with Jesus, united to Jesus. Well, Jesus is part of what? He's part of the Trinity, he's part of the Godhead. So what we're saying is that the church will become part of the Godhead. That, that's the, if you're wondering what's the end game in, in all of this Christianity business? Well, the end game is that we'll be united to Jesus and Jesus united to God and the Spirit and all of these will be you know, closed up, so to speak, at the end of the world. That, that's the end game, that we are going to experience God from the inside rather than the outside, the way we, we experience Him now, okay? So, since all these things are to happen in the twinkling of an eye when Jesus returns, then it's important that we have an understanding of the end times, you know, when Jesus returns, as taught by Jesus. That's why that's the seventh major doctrine. If the sixth major doctrine is the kingdom, well, the seventh major doctrine has to be what happens at the end of the world, okay? So in our lesson today, we're going to examine what did Jesus Himself teach His disciples concerning His return at the end of the world? Okay, so the main teaching by Jesus on this topic is found in Matthew 24 and 25. So if you're following in your Bibles today, open to 24, 25, and as usual, I'll throw the scriptures up on the screen. So let's, uh, let's uh, put uh, the teaching into context, you know, what's going on. Jesus, uh, in Matthew 24, Jesus has just rebuked the religious leaders because of their hypocrisy and their lack of faith. In Matthew 24, the Lord begins a long and difficult passage describing the end of not only the Jewish nation, which will take place in about 40 years you know, from, from the time when He's speaking in the future, but He also talks about the end of the world when He will return. So we begin with Jesus leaving the temple and as He leaves the temple, the apostles point out the magnificent buildings of the temple which He has just said will be deserted. Now you need to understand, when Jesus was you know, on earth and in this scene when He's leaving the temple with His apostles, the temple had just undergone 50 years of reconstruction. You think church building projects are long, you know, take 18 months or so. For 50 years they had been working on rebuilding and refurbishing the temple, okay? So let's pick it up right there, Matthew 24 verses one and two. So Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when His disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to Him. You know, 50 years of reconstruction, how wonderful these things are. And He said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. So Jesus responds to their comment and their wonderment by saying that the buildings will not only be empty, they'll be completely torn down. So this sets up further questions by the disciples, Peter and John and James and Andrew. They wanted more information about what He had just said, so they questioned Him about this. Next verse. They say, as He was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately now, saying, tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? You know, it's interesting that two of the apostles who later write about the end times, Peter and John, right? are in this group here asking him, well, what are you talking about? These buildings are going to be, are going to be torn, torn down. So they ask two questions. When will the destruction of the temple be? And what signs will accompany the second coming and the end of the world, which the second coming will bring? So whether they thought that both events would happen at the same time, or there would be a lapse of time between them is unknown. I suspect that because they were Jews, they thought if the temple is destroyed, that must be the end of the world, because they couldn't imagine a worse thing than that. Okay. So they didn't know, and they were asking Jesus to instruct them in these matters. So let's be sure we understand the questions. When will the buildings be destroyed? You said these, nothing will be standing here. Okay, when is that going to happen? And two, what are the signs of your coming? You know, what are the signs of your return and the end? 
So the next section we're going to read is very complex, but it, it's understandable if we break it into three major periods that Jesus is going to talk about, okay? All right, so the first period he's going to talk about is, or the view, let's, let's, let's use the word view, the, the point of view, okay? So the first view is the panoramic view. In other words, in verses four to 14, he's going to talk about a panoramic view that includes the moment when he's with his disciples somewhere around 37 AD, all the way to the end of time when he returns. So his first comments are going to give them an overall view from, from the moment that they're talking all the way to the end of the world, and it'll include some comments about 70 AD. That's when the temple was destroyed by the Jews. Okay. Then in um, uh, verses 15 to 35, Jesus is going to telescope in to 70 AD and talk about specifically what happens in 70 AD when the Romans come and they destroy the temple and so on and so forth. So 15 to 35, a very focused view. Okay? And then he's going to telescope in verses 36 to 44, he's going to telescope to the second coming at the end of the world. So first section, a panoramic view. Second section, he's going to focus in on 70 AD. Third section, he's going to focus in on the second coming and the end of the world. So if you understand that, if you keep that in mind, then it'll make sense of this passage here, which is rather complicated, okay? So let's begin with the panoramic view. And we begin with verse four. So he begins, the panoramic view. And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. So the instructions given so that they will know and avoid false teachers and prophets in these matters. And have there been false teachers and prophets to this day? To this day, we continue to have people coming up with the harebrained schemes and ideas about this about this passage right here. So he warns them right off the bat, be careful, there's going to be a lot of false teaching about this particular thing. All right, verses five to eight, he says, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you're not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there'll be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of the birth pangs. So what does he say? Remember, panoramic view. He's saying the cycle of false prophets, wars, troubles in the world will continue until the end of time. But these things in themselves are not the signs. They are only the beginning of the things which will get progressively worse before not only the end of Jerusalem comes, but also the end of the world. Well, was he talking the truth? Have you seen the news? Did you see the news yes, just last night about these hundreds of thousands of refugees that are just pouring out of Syria and Afghanistan and, and Iraq? It doesn't matter what you think about the Muslim religion and so on and so forth. These people, I mean, they're, they're, they've been bombed, they've been starved to death, they've been chased, they've been killed. You know, uh, there was one scene so poignant, you know, uh, uh, there was a man talking to a police officer who wouldn't let him into the train station. He had a ticket to go to Germany. And he said to him, he said, I'm a human being like you. I haven't eaten in two days. I have small children. There's no bathrooms and so on and so forth. You know, he was appealing to him, never mind religion or politics. I'm a human being and you're a human being. What would you do in my place? So, have the troubles continued? Jesus said, wars, rumors of wars, you know, it's always going to be there. I'm not saying we shouldn't care, I'm just saying we shouldn't be surprised, is what I'm saying. There's always going to be trouble, he said, right to the end of time. Verse 9 to 12, he says, then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. 
So here he's paralleling 2 Thessalonians where Paul talks about the end of the world and what must take place first. We're going to talk about that next week, so keep this passage in mind here. Um, the man of lawlessness that Paul talks about who deceives many through false signs and tries to take the place of God. He has to be revealed, so to speak, before the actual end of the world comes. Well, Jesus describes here the devolution of the world. You know, we talk about evolution. Evolution says we're getting better all the time. We're getting better all the time. You know, every generation, we're getting better. We're adapting. You know, that's evolution. But what Jesus is talking about is devolution. In other words, not getting better all the time, we're getting worse all the time. You know? The earth is, is, is getting worse all the time. It's not improving, it's losing a lot of its resources and so on and so forth. You know, it's breaking down, everything breaks down. And so Jesus is talking about the devolution of mankind. And the devolution has a cycle. It begins with a theological fall, meaning people stop believing in God. After that, it, there's a philosophical fall, meaning people try to make up the reason to be alive and what explains life without God. That's a philosophical fall. And they come up with all kinds of crazy ideas. You know, might makes right. You know, and, and so, and, you know, um, uh, as long as it works, it's right. Those are kind of philosophical pragmatism you know, and, and relativism. They come up with these philosophical ideas that explain life without reference to God. That's a philosophical fall. Well, what follows a philosophical fall is a moral fall. Because if God is not there establishing an objective law and everything is relative, well, you're going to have a moral fall, right? You know, well, who cares? Uh, Ashley Madison, the, 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 the website where people go to cheat on their spouses. 37 million users. And after it got hacked and all the bad publicity and so on and so forth, I read in the paper that it's, it keeps getting thousands of new users every day. A moral fall. You know, if it's good for me, why not? Nobody gets hurt, it's my business. Right? And then after the moral fall comes a social fall, social chaos. And usually before the world falls apart, there's a revival of some kind, a spiritual awakening that brings man back to God. Well, this cycle of falling and restoration keeps going throughout history. And the point is that at some point it's going to be so bad that either the world will be destroyed or Jesus comes. So if somebody said, where are we in the cycle? I would say, well, in the cycle now, we're in the moral part, the moral failure. Well, how do I know that? Because our leaders are promoting that two men can be married. You know, I mean, what's next? So we're in the moral failing part of that cycle. I have hope because either Jesus comes or there's some sort of spiritual revival. That's why if we're preaching the gospel, let's preach it, that's okay. All right. So here, in, in a microcosmic way, Jesus is describing the devolution of man and he's saying this is normal. Don't be surprised, don't be afraid. Those of you who speak in my name, you'll be hated, don't think you'll be popular. Verse 13, but the one who endures to the end he will be saved. In contrast, he promises that the faithful, despite all this devolution and trouble, he promises that the faithful will be saved despite the trials, despite the evil in the world. Verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. So he also promises that the Great Commission will be carried out and must be carried out before the end, which end, the end of the world, comes. So this is the panoramic view of events and the flow of history that will occur until the return of Jesus Christ. Okay? So panoramic view, stuff keeps happening, the world keeps devolving, don't be discouraged despite the troubles in the world and so on and so forth, those who are faithful till the end, we'll be saved. There's the panoramic view. Okay, now he backs up and he gives them a telescopic view of 70 AD, verses 15 to 35. So let's have a little local historical background here to set this up. <coughs> Judea was rebellious and longed to return to the glory days of independence and power you know, that they enjoyed at the time of Solomon. So in the early 60s, I don't mean the 1960s, I mean 60 AD, in the early 60s, they had such unrest that Rome sent troops in to quell the rebellion. 
So from 66 to 70 AD, the Roman armies successfully laid siege to Jerusalem and totally destroyed the city and the temple with over a million people. This total destruction of the Jewish nation was the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy to the disciples some 33 years earlier described in the passage that we're about to read. The disciples wanted to know when would this happen? You know that the, the stones of this magnificent building will all be down. When is that going to happen? And so Jesus gives them the signs to watch for. For what? The end of the world? No, 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 no. For the end of the Jewish nation. So let's read verse 15. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. So what's the first sign of the end of the Jewish nation? Well, the first sign is the abomination of desolation. The point was that when the temple would be desecrated, this would be a sign that the destruction of the entire city was near and they should escape. Now in Daniel chapter 11 verse 31 and 12 11, Daniel had prophesied that the temple would be defiled in the future and it was in the days of the Maccabees, it was in the day, in other words, Daniel says one day the temple will be desecrated and his prophecy was fulfilled uh, about 100 years before Christ, 100 years BC. Uh, it was a war, a local, a regional war, the Syrian up north, the, the Syrian king was trying to put down the, the, the Jews, trying to control them, and uh, his F, uh, the main thing that he was trying to do was to shut down the temple. He forbade circumcision, for example. And then he even came, uh, uh, Epiphanes, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, the name of the king, Syrian king, he came into Jerusalem and he sacrificed a pig on the altar. Uh, in, 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 in the temple, which absolutely desecrated the, the temple. Imagine sacrificing a pig on the, on the altar in Jerusalem. That was, that was terrible. So, 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 so Daniel had prophesied that this type of thing would happen. Okay, keep that in mind. So Jesus picks up this idea, the desecration part, he picks up this idea and he says that in the same way, when the temple would be defiled by Gentiles during their lifetimes, it'll be the sign to escape. So if you were a Jew, if you were a disciple listening to Jesus, you'd be thinking some hundred years ago, the temple was defiled by the northern Syrian king, sacrificed a pig. So Jesus is saying, in your lifetime, when you see the temple desecrated in like manner, that'll be a sign for you to get out of town, because the end is coming, all right? So Luke, in chapter 21, verse 20, tells us that the surrounding of the temple by foreign armies is what constituted the defilement. You see, the Romans had standards, you know, like shields for different companies, okay, military companies, and these shields were idolatrous and they were often used for worship by the soldiers uh, themselves. And so surrounding the temple with idolatrous images, this is what constituted the defilement of the temple. Now there are a lot of scholars that differ here as to what the abomination actually was, and they refer to all kinds of Jewish historians for events that occurred before or during or after the siege that would fit. However, only Luke in chapter 21 verse 20 uh, provides a biblical reference that actually fits the context. So if I have a choice between going with a Jewish scholar or or an apostle, you know, the, the, the scripture itself, I'll go with the scripture. The scriptures say, Luke 21, 20, that the surrounding of the temple with the idolatrous, shield, uh, uh, idolatrous shields, this is what constituted the defilement. This is the sign, the fulfillment of the sign that Jesus was talking about. So when he says, he who reads, he means he who reads Daniel, and along with Christ's cryptogram, that person will be able uh, to know when it's time to get out. And many did. Historically, we know that in 68 AD, two years after the siege started, the majority of Christians who were living in Jerusalem escaped to a town called Pella 
and thus avoided being killed in the massacre. And today you can actually visit Pella. I mean, it's, the ruins are still there and the history of that town and so on and so forth. Okay. So verse 19, let's keep going. Still in the same section. He says, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. So the tribulation, that's the suffering caused by the Romans, which wiped out the nation. Over, over a million people killed, are you kidding me? In those days? I mean, it's terrible any time, but in those days? And the combination of the gravity of the sin, the Jews rejected their Messiah, and the horror of the punishment, their nation was wiped out and has never been rebuilt in the way that it was at that time. That's the tribulation. That, that, nothing like that has ever happened. In verse 22 he continues, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, who are the elect? Not the Jews, the elect of the Christians. For the sake of the elect, the, those days will be cut short. So God's providence permitted this war to end so that the Christians would not also be annihilated along with the Jews. Remember, the city was destroyed and the Romans, they didn't make a distinction between a, a Jew, Jewish Jew and a Christian Jew. For them, all the Jews were the same. And so Jesus is you know, prophesying, saying, it'll be terrible, but it'll stop short of including the Christians as well. In other words, the Romans didn't go from city to city to city to city to, to, to seek out more Jews to kill. Once they had destroyed Jerusalem, they stopped. Okay? Except for a band of, uh, you know, a band of holdouts uh, near the, the Dead Sea, but that's a whole other story. Very interesting, but we don't have time now. All right, verse 23 to 26. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there He is, do not believe Him, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance, so if they say to you, behold, He is in the wilderness, do not go out, or behold, He is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. So the believers would naturally associate the destruction of Jerusalem with the return of Jesus. Remember I said? A lot of them thought, wow, when the temple's destroyed, that must be the end of the world. We can't even think of anything worse that could happen. So they assumed when the temple is destroyed, it's the end of the world and Jesus is returning. And Jesus warns them, don't think that. Don't assume that. Okay? So he warns them against being deceived by those who would claim to be the Lord or to speak from God. Now Josephus, a Jewish historian of the time, documents how during this period, rumors of the Messiah coming or being present circulated in order to keep people in the city. And so in those days, hysteria and fear produced a lot of different prophets who claimed visage, uh, 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 visions and, and messages from God. One fake prophet said that he would separate the Sea of Galilee and 25,000 people followed him out there, but nothing happened. So verse 27, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what does he say to them? He tells them that when He returns, it will be evident. There, there won't be any doubt. There won't be people going, hmm, is, is, that, is this the Messiah returning or is this not? You know, let's take a vote. Uh-uh. He says, when the, when the Lord returns, it will be evident to everyone, like lightning across the sky, everyone will easily and readily know that it will be Him. So when he's saying this, he's saying, don't be fooled by people you know, who are saying, they're the Messiah, stay in the city, blah, don't be fooled. When I return, everybody will know about it. The good, the bad, the believers and the unbelievers, everybody will know when I return. Okay? Just like when there's lightning, there's no doubt by anyone. Oh, was that lightning? Everybody knows. Verse 28, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So the corpse is the Jewish nation. The vultures are the false Christs and the false prophets. So he says, when you see them in abundance, they will be a second sign that the end of Jerusalem is near, not the end of the world. So when will these stones be torn down? Sign number one, 
when you see the temple defiled. Sign number two, when all kinds of messiahs and false Christs are popping up all over the place. Beware. Verse 29, he says, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of heaven will be shaken. So the first word in this verse presents a problem to some people. The first word is immediate, well, but immediately. So if we were to make this next section here a discussion about the end of the world, a discussion about the second coming of Jesus, then it has to happen right after the destruction of Jerusalem. Because he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and then he says, and immediately after. Okay? Important to realize that. And there are some people that actually believe that, that Jesus came 70, it's called the 70 AD theory. And, and that idea was running rampant in the church a couple of years back. So he's saying, since the, and of course Paul will say, since the man of lawlessness has not been revealed, Jesus has not returned. Therefore this passage must still be talking about events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem. And the point you need to remember for our class this morning, verse 29, he's still, talking, he's still focused in on 70 AD. He says, you know, uh, when the temple is, uh, is uh, desecrated, when there are a lot of false Christs, you know, the end is near for the temple, for the Jewish nation. Okay? Verse 30 to 31. He says, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And He will send forth His angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So, verse 29 to 31 is still talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the effects that it has on others and believers. So here he switches. Notice the language. He's using a, a, a language style, a literary style called apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature. And this type of style of writing or talking is used by prophets in the Old Testament uh, to describe cataclysmic historical and political events. For example, Isaiah in chapter 13 uses this kind of language to describe the destruction of Babylon. So when Babylon fell, you know, the evil you know, nation of Babylon, Isaiah uses the same kind of language, you know, the stars falling, the moon falling, the sun blowing up and whatever. You know. What's he talking about? Is he talking about some, some, something happening up in the sky? Well, no. He's talking about the destruction of one of the you know, major empires of the world and to, to, to convey how earth-shaking this is, he uses this cataclysmic, he uses this uh, 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 apocalyptic style of, 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 of writing and speaking, usually the stars falling and the moon filled with blood and all that kind of thing. All right. So Jesus is using language symbolizing the destruction of heavenly bodies to describe the very real fate of the world at the end, yes, but also the end and the destruction of nations here on earth. So, so Isaiah used this language to talk about the destruction of Babylon. Jesus is using this language to talk about the destruction of the Jewish nation. An earth shattering thing. I mean, God's people are being wiped off the face of the earth at this time. Now, in this case, as I say, Jesus is talking about the end of the Jewish nation as a people under God's special care. And that was significant. They were God's people and they're not going to be God's people anymore as a culture. Now he talks about the coming of the Son of Man. And it's easy to think, oh, that's the end of the world. But this refers, this idea, the coming of the Son of Man, refers both to the second coming at the end of the world and the final judgment, but it also can be used to refer to any judgment that God makes on a nation. In this particular case, the judgment that God is going to visit on the Jewish nation. It also fits the context of the passage. The Jews who rejected Jesus now will see Him coming as a form of judgment on their nation and a terrible catastrophe that would horrify the world but liberate Christians and the gospel from the Jewish persecution. What was holding Christianity back from the first 20 years? Well, the constant persecution of the Jews. 
But once the Jewish nation was taken out of the way and Christianity was seen as an independent, standalone religion, poof, it took off. It wasn't just a sect of Judaism, it was, well, the fulfillment of Judaism, but it was a thing all on its own. Um, the Greek word translated angel here can also be translated as messenger. So this verse can be seen as prophecy concerning the spreading of the gospel throughout the world, when? After the fall of Jerusalem. In verse 14 said that this needed to be done before Christ returned and now with the ideological and cultural restraints of Judaism removed, Christianity could now flourish even more. Now in verses 32 to 35, Jesus warns them to pay attention to the signs He has given them because they will happen in their generation and He promises by His word that these things will happen. So all the way up to 35, He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. It'll be total, it'll be catastrophic, but, but the positive side of it is that the gospel, the message will go out into all four corners of the world. The message of the gospel will be released. Okay, now, you know, focused in on 70 AD, now he backs up and now he focuses in on the end of the world when he will come, when we begin in verse 36. He says, but of that day, remember he gave signs for when the destruction of Jerusalem was going to come. Right? So that they would know when it was happening and they would know when it, they should escape. Now he says, but of that day, which day? Well, the end, you know, when will you return? They asked him. Well, of that day and hour, no one knows. See? No clues. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So nobody knows the time, not even Jesus, while He is with His disciples. He knew when Jerusalem would end when He was with the disciples, but He did not know when His second coming would be. All right. So verse 37, 39, let's keep going. He says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man B. So for the end of Jerusalem, lots of signs, a warning to get out and save themselves. But for the end of the world, no signs. There will be no cataclysmic signs. All will seem normal. There'll be wars, there'll be natural disasters, there'll be social upheaval, and at the same time, some nations will be in prosperity, you know, a good wheat harvest. Uh, you know, same old, same old. Stuff will just be happening the way it has always happened, okay? Normal in the sense that the believers will be preparing themselves for the second coming and the end of the world, and the rest of the world will be ignoring it until it'll be too late, just like Noah. He's building the boat, he's getting ready. We're building the church, we're getting ready. That's why I always say, our job is not to go into the world and fix the world, yes, to give a good witness to the world by feeding the hungry and the poor and so on and so forth. That's our witness, okay? But we're not trying to fix the world. That's not our job. We're not social reformers. Uh, our, our, our job is to call people out of the world into the boat, get into the boat, the church, okay? So, uh, so everything will seem normal until the end comes and boom. Verse 40 to 41, he says, then there will be two men in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. Oh boy, have we mangled this passage. <laughs> some take this verse to mean that before Jesus returns, some, some people will be taken up in a quote rapture and disappear to be with God in heaven. This is a major part of the premillennialist view of the rapture and the thousand year reign. Don't have time to get into that, but that's what it is. In context, however, Jesus is talking about readiness and He says that when He returns suddenly, right? When He returns suddenly, one will be saved and one will be lost. No time for repentance or change. That's what He's talking about. Just like Noah, when the rain came, they were taken and they disappeared into the ark and the others remained to die in the flood. 
When Jesus comes, the faithful will be taken to be with Him and the disbelievers immediately put away from His presence. No time, no time for repentance. Oh, oh, oh wait, 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 Jesus, hang on, hang on, let me think. Okay, okay, I do believe. Uh, 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 doesn't work like that. That's why the thousand year reign is so comforting. We got a thousand years to figure it all out. You know, we can change our mind, we, we can take our time. But that's not what Jesus said. And then verses 42 to 44, since the end is like this, he says we should always be prepared and not foolishly lapse into sin, thinking we have plenty of time to repent and be ready for the return. We never know, we need to be ready. So, after this passage, Jesus gives exhortations to vigilance. That's chapter 24 all the way to the end. And what he does, and we're not going to read them, I just want to fit everything into proper context. So after he's described the panoramic view, destruction of Jerusalem, his second coming at the end, we don't know when it'll be, you just have to be ready. What does he do? He follows up with three parables. The parable of the uh, evil slave. You know, here the lesson is not to presume that we have luxury of sinning because the Lord is far away. It, he can come at any time and the judgment is sure for those who are unfaithful. So that's the lesson of the parable of the slave. Then the parable of the ten virgins. Here Jesus warns against the foolishness of not being ready. It isn't a question of gross evil, it's a question of negligence. To neglect Christ will bring destruction in the end as well. And then the third parable, the parable of the talents. Here the warning is for those who are in the kingdom, but who fail to expand its borders or fail to serve the king with zeal. This slave was not caught or surprised unprepared. He just assumed that his preparation was sufficient when it wasn't. So all these parables have the element of preparation, judgment and punishment for those who neglect to prepare for the return of Jesus. And then finally, the final scene, you know, to wrap it all up, is the great judgment scene in uh, chapter uh, uh, 25 uh, verses 31 to 46. This is the climax of his discourse, the judgment scene at the end of the world. Uh, those found to be righteous have obeyed the commands to love God, and they refer to Him as Lord, and they also have loved their neighbor. And those condemned have the same judgment and are condemned because they didn't love their neighbor. And the point is, if you don't love your neighbor, you can't say you love the Lord. The punishment, of course, and the reward is eternal in nature. Okay, so today this was the view of the end time from Jesus' perspective. Next week, our last lesson in the series, we're going to look at the end time, but how Paul describes it. And Paul has a different perspective on how he describes it, much more practical. He doesn't use an apocalyptic uh, language. You know, he, he's very, you know, this happens and that happens and this happens. So we'll finish up with Paul's view of the end. Thank you very much.